Hello, my name is Paz. I'm a respiratory therapist at night and a wardrobe stylist and a fashion creative during the day. Turns out, I'm not the only one in the medical field who pursues their passion. In celebration of Respiratory Care Week, I'll be talking to my incredible colleagues who are healthcare heroes and also artists and entrepreneurs in their own right. This is my peeps. Today's guest in this episode is Mike. He started his career as a respiratory therapist in 1992. He worked many years as a bedside therapist at Northridge Hospital, County Facilities, in Registry, and Transport. Mike has been teaching basic life support since late 1990s. As his business grew by word of mouth, he started teaching more classes and different certifications. Mike's mom and sons also teach and run daily operations. That's three generations of educators. And now, four generations, including his grandsons who help him sharpen pencils and shred papers. His training facility, Cal Med Training Center, formerly known as CPR3G, is offering classes in BLS, ACLS, PALS, ventilator, EKG, and more. Two years ago, Mike joined the Cardiac Surgery Medical Missions, traveling to impoverished countries as part of his team. He also started a teaching program for local providers while abroad. Hello, everyone. Welcome back again to my peeps, another episode. Um, today, we're going to talk to Mike. So, hello, Mike. Hello, How are Pop. you doing? Great. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you because whenever I see you, I always have to take my BLS or my ACLS or my other certifications. But it's this is like really nice to talk to you um, just one-on-one. -on -one. So take me back and tell me more about your life before you transitioned to a respiratory therapist. Um, well, in my, I was in the Marine Corps and I was a Stinger missile gunner, anti-aircraft. Oh, wow. And then I went to Desert Storm. After the deployment, after that, and after I was done, I, um, my brother-in-law, um, was in respiratory school. He was graduating within a couple of months after that. And he started talking to me about it. I went down, spoke to re a recruiter and probably in two or three weeks later, I was in school myself. It was pretty quick. I became, and it hurt. wasn't, it wasn't that hard to get into respiratory school around. Not in 1990, 92, 92. It wasn't not too hard at all. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You yeah, so now you have to wait. There's a waiting list, and you have oh, yeah. to go to a different school, and they only accept a certain number of people. So exactly, yeah. yeah. Back then, different times, totally. Mm hmm So, oh, yeah. do you remember any memorable stories at, in your early days as a respiratory therapist? Um, you know, I was thinking about that recently, and when I look back, I, um, you know, I did what most new grads do did. Signed up for registry. I had my regular job to anchor me down. I worked night shift, day shift, mostly night shifts. Uh, I was driving all over LA County, working at Harbor General, um, many facilities, um, emergency room, traumas, uh, lots of that. What I remember in comparison to the way things are nowadays is, you know, we didn't have rapid response teams back then. Mm -hmm. So we weren't able to, uh, identify early clinical deterioration. So we had many, many more cardiac arrests, many, many more, probably two or three times more. And then, you know, once that was implemented, uh, we saw those numbers, you know, um, dwindle down a little bit because we were able to, you know, get an EKG and send the patient to ICU before coding. So I remember a lot of um, many, many cardiac arrests um, that I was running back and forth to all the time. And, um, uh, but I think the, my most memorable um, mm -hmm. memory in uh, respiratory was uh, I, I began doing flight transports. Mm -hmm. I signed up for flight transport with a, a local company and we'd fly um, I either international or, or um, local transports, uh, transporting critically ill patients on ventilators from point A to point B. And um, I, there was a patient in the Philippines who needed us uh, his family members um, contracted us to bring him to San Francisco 
So we went and picked them up there in a Learjet. Um, within about 20 minutes, once we got up to altitude, he went into cardiac arrest. It was probably a thrombus, pulmonary emboli, coronary emboli. So he went into cardiac arrest, then we did CPR for 47 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it was just me for CPR. So when I was, yeah. um, when I was doing that, well, I used one hand for compressions, the other hand to bag. And when I got tired, I switched. So that's wow. how it um, But you know, because that's of the, when you uh, test your skills in transport because you don't have any help at all. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it, in a Learjet, it's hard to stand up. So, so body mechanics was a little bit tough, but the adrenaline carries you through it, you know? Um, plus we had just gave big hugs to the family and promised them that he was going to be okay, you know? So, so it was, it was an emotional experience at the same time, um, mm -hmm. more than anything, I think. Um, but he did, um, he did pass away, he expired in the air after 47 minutes. And then when we had to land in, we landed in Korea for fuel and to change the pilots out. Is it um, North Korea or South Korea? <laughs> <laughs> South Korea. Okay, just want to make sure. <laughs> uh, we landed in Incheon, Incheon, South Korea, okay. which was a brand new airport, brand new airport back mm -hmm. then. This, this goes back to, I was in the field for maybe eight or 10 years by then. Um, 2001, yeah, it was Easter weekend. And um, we landed in Incheon and it was a new airport and they didn't really have policies in place for dealing with, with uh, bodies, you know, dead uh, patients who expired. So what happened was the coroner came out, the police, the chief of police, um, because the IVs were backing up, there was multiple IVs being started. There was a lot of blood in the aircraft mm -hmm. and um, they arrested us for a homicide investigation. And, wow. <laughs> and they literally took us lights and You can't make this up. <laughs> can't make this up. can't make this up. No, this is my locked up abroad story. <laughs> locked up abroad um so they brought us lights and sirens to the um to the uh, uh police station and 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 we were there um at the the korean jail for a couple of days i think we we had to call for help we had to call america for help and they sent wow. some to um i guess negotiate you could say negotiate mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. and then we signed something um we don't know what we signed to this day because it was not in english but the american um advisor negotiator he he, he assured us that we were we would be released uh so we were released wow that's crazy yeah. how did you feel that moment that you were trying to save a life and next thing you know you're trying you're going to jail because of something that was just a completely misunderstanding complete misunderstanding mm -hmm. what what were you thinking i remember i know you have a family back home in the united oh, yeah. states so it must you must have been terrified well it was you know the nurse and i and the doctor that was with us, you know, all we could really think was that um, the patient, Miguel, um, mm -hmm. you know, the family, you know, we had just seen the family just before and they were very, very concerned, but they also had, you know, confidence that everything was going to be okay because we we're bringing them to San Francisco where the brother of the patient was, I believe, a CFO. He sent for him. Mm -hmm. um, so that was on our mind, you know, it was a... Um, it was a sad experience. It was very unfortunate. At yeah, the same time, we needed to get home. Is. We didn't know what was going to happen. And I remember on the upcoming Tuesday, I had promised to take my son to Legoland. Aww. And I needed to get to Legoland. That is it the son nice. that who's teaching ACLS right now and uh, pals? Yeah. And... Uh-huh. Justin. Yeah. Yeah. Justin, a, yeah. Uh, and he's a and respiratory he's, therapist now. Exactly. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about that, how okay. you have three generations of mm -hmm. medical in your oh. family. And um, yeah, and we, I made it. We made it to Legoland. Nice. Oh, that, it. yeah, I I would be crying in jail if that was me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. I think, you know, I don't, that's, that's that's like the best RT story that I've <laughs> I've heard in my like ten years of my career plus 
few years in a respiratory school. Yeah. Quite an experience. Quite an experience. <laughs> yeah, quite an experience. So moving on, um, uh -huh. you've been a veteran in this field. Like you said, you've been an RT since 1992. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most important thing that you learned as a therapist? Um, the most important thing is, um, you know, when we work with our colleagues, um, the other staff, our patients, um, you know, I've learned, and I think most respiratory therapists have learned that everybody has a story. Everybody mm -hmm. has a story. Mm -hmm. it, we're, we're, it's more than just giving the nebulizer or weaning a patient from a vent after heart surgery, you know, things like that. Everybody's got their story. Um, you know, so I think that that's, I would say probably at the top of my list and something else is that, especially because I teach and I follow the, you know, the evidence-based science guidelines and the updates, um, you know, they call it practicing medicine for a reason. Exactly. Practicing, and it's ever evolving and it's just, interesting and, and exciting to know that um you know the best is yet to come you know exactly it, you know it, yeah it's always evolving so being an rt what is the most rewarding part of your job um i there, there's a lot <laughs> i only pause mm -hmm. because i'm thinking there's so many things um you know you get, making friends is is one of those things you know um also um you know, making a difference. It sounds cliche, but yeah, making friends, making a difference. And um, all the lateral movements that we can make in the respiratory field is just, um, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's limitless, I would say, um, especially with being able to teach and join medical missions, um, going into teaching and, 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 and then still seeing my friends, my colleagues from the hospital, when they come back, like you, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I can still, I'm still connected. I'm very, my heart is still there with respiratory. Um, although I'm, I'm mostly teaching nowadays, but the autonomy and the freedom um, in respiratory has been more than rewarding, I would say, because, you know, you can do pulmonary functions and bronchs one day and then go to the ER and uh, critical care. Um, you know, so a lot of opportunity like um, Sun Tzu, you know, Sun Tzu, the philosopher, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he says opportunities multiply when they are seized, you know, so, I love so it. you know, I, it's, um, you know, there's so much out there for, for us to, um, you know, go out there and do, I think. It's yeah, great. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people that are not in the medical field don't really know specifically our job description or what we do or who we are. Right. Now that no. there's a pandemic, people yeah. are being, oh, you guys are the ones behind the life support machines. Yes, it's right. called mechanical ventilators. Thank you very much. And we do way more than that, you know, but. I was so happy early on in March or April when COVID hit hard <laughs> that they stopped calling them respirators. They finally call them ventilators, you know? After yeah. All now they're yeah. going to, you know? <laughs> I love it because I would see articles about respiratory therapists and I was like, oh, that's me, that's me, you know? And exactly. I feel pride about it. And you and I, we both, and other uh, therapists as well, we all feel pride about our work. And mm -hmm. we're starting to appreciate now that people are recognizing more what we do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So you Absolutely. talked about a little bit about teaching um and that's one of the reasons how we met because i was a student at northridge hospital when i, I first remember. met you uh -huh. and then when i became a therapist you already had you, you're you already teaching um certifications mm -hmm. and i perfectly remember you still don't have an office you were still teaching in your that. garage at home at so home. you really, really come a long way. Um, so do you want to talk about more about um, Cal Medical Training Center and that? how did um, that come about? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, in the late 90s, I became a respiratory supervisor. And part of my part of my job description was education, too, and also marketing. 
and it was really marketing that my marketing descript, job description duties that brought me to this um, because we were um, we were also running an um, outpatient type service and a pulmonary rehab. So we would go out to uh, post acute care type settings, um, mm -hmm. facilities and in service, um, well market. And also we started in servicing, just providing, um, you know, um, um, short in services on suctioning, we'll say, and, and a few other things and giving CEs. And it was part of, you know, marketing and education. And then I, I, you know, I thought, well, what if I, if I become a BLS instructor, you know, that would help with marketing. And at the same time, I can, I can teach, you know, mm. I didn't really at the time, I would say, know that I had a passion for teaching, mm -hmm. but it was, um, you know, but I did have a passion for my work, for my job and, 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 you know, doing the best they can with that. Um, so they supported me. They completely supported me. They, they helped me become a BLS instructor. Um, so I started doing that and I was teaching, you know, a few people here and there at these facilities. It went well, but not only, I would say about a year later, the hospital closed. Um, so yeah. that was it. The hospital closed yeah. down. And, um, but I still was an AHA instructor for BLS. So um, working at Northridge still at the same time. So I just, I mentioned to one person literally and that I was, I teach BLS and um, that's where it all began. Really. Uh, I started recertifying my respiratory coworkers, colleagues, um, teaching at my house, one person a week, I would say one or two. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, word spread and mm -hmm. um, it, it spread and it, it took about, you know, 20 years to get to that now, you know, it's been about 20 years now and um, started teaching at my house. And then I started doing some mobile classes, driving, taking mannequins, driving my son, oh. um, you know, my son was four or five at the time. And sometimes he would help me bring the mannequins and he would demonstrate compressions. Oh, and now, now your, your grandson, there we go. Sorry. Your grandson is sharpening, which is Justin's um, son. Exactly. Yep. is in the business too, sharpening pencils and just being in the office. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. yeah um, four years old, six years old, um, they uh, sharpen pencils and, um, <laughs> you know, shred paper. And so we're actually four generations now. We're 4G. Um, Love yeah, it. so then, Love then it. you know, um, uh, so I was just teaching BLS and then 9-11 happened. So 9-11 had much to do, I think, with this. Um, because um, although I was no longer in the Marine Corps, I I went back. I rejoined after 9-11, mm -hmm. and then I went to Iraq, but at the same time, so I left respiratory for that year, and um, I asked my mom to become a BLS instructor, and mm -hmm. she did. She did, and she nailed it. She did such a great job. She has, like, mm -hmm. such a... You know my mom. Yeah, um, your mom's amazing. So When she, when she came back... Oh, yeah. They loved her. So I wanted to leave uh -huh. her teaching BLS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's like the BLS queen at your office. She is. She is. She is. And um, yeah, and I remember I've like I've taken your mom's class a few times for years uh -huh. and years now. Oh, yeah. um, and she's just been amazing. She's very knowledgeable and she always tells the story that you choked when you were a baby. <laughs> oh yeah. And I she remember. had to do. <laughs> always. I always hear that. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. yeah that, was, that was amazing. So um, oh. let's talk a little about your uh, medical mission since you still have your medical license as a respiratory therapist, uh -huh. yeah. um, but you're mainly doing teaching right now and running your business. But uh -huh. at the same time, when you have free time in your hands or you schedule yourself going to medical missions. Um, yeah. So uh, about two years ago, I started doing mm -hmm. medical missions. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've been to the Dominican Republic twice and more recently this year, uh, Tanzania and Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, it, my first role was was not respiratory. It, well, it was data collection for research uh, mm. for, for the University of Minnesota, 
So mm -hmm. my scope of practice was outside of respiratory with you wow, know, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of things. And, um, and I just loved it. Um, you know, um, since then I've been teaching, um, also teaching and mm -hmm. uh, the physicians, med students abroad, nurses, wow, that's intubation. Amazing. So I, I, I teach them a lot of respiratory type skills, intubation, um, mm -hmm. airway procedures, also interosseous. Uh, wow. because, uh, it, it's, it hasn't made its way around the world yet with IO. Um, and, but mostly I would say with the most, because it's car their cardiology type medical missions, heart surgery, um, repairing tetralogy of phthalate and valves, you know, depending mm -hmm. on the groups, um, wow. EKGs, a lot of EKGs mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ACLS type, type interventions. Um, wow. And then, uh, I saw like a picture of you standing next to some guys with guns. <laughs> that was oh, yeah. pretty terrifying. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was an experience. That was Nigeria. <laughs> and so we had um, security with us that was from the army and the police, they, they contracted. Mm -hmm. So they had AK-47s and uh, grenade launchers because uh, wow. Americans can be kidnapped. Uh, there's a wow. threat of kidnapping over there. Um, so they were with us 24 seven all the time. Even that's the first time that I've taught uh, ACLS and EKG to a class while there's armed guards with uh, AKs right there next to us. You know, <laughs> so that was interesting. That was very yeah, interesting. First time that's, <laughs> that's crazy. So we're running out of time right now. And as we come to a close, um, I just want to ask now during the pandemic, there's a lot of businesses closed, but. Mm. Of course, you're in an essential business because mm -hmm. you teach and we need to do our certifications every year. So tell us more about the COVID precautions that your company does in order to create a safer environment so that students can feel safe enrolling in, in your school. Oh, sure. Uh, well, we have plexiglass. I think you saw those pictures. Mm -hmm. It looks like a fish tank that I'm in. <laughs> um, so we have plexiglass in our classrooms and, um, you know, sanitizer, gloves or op gloves if they want, you know, we have plenty of gloves. Um, and um, uh, temperature checks, all the CDC guidelines. We actually started doing um, all of that before even the LA City guidelines came out. You yeah, know, I love it. it. We saw it coming. Um, and uh, we modify, I teach virtual classes, uh, three of our classes I can do virtually on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, EKG is one of them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when they come in, they have their own table and their own equipment now mm -hmm. and we keep them distanced, um, you know, uh, properly distanced apart. And uh, we modify the skills per AHA, you know, approved by AHA. So we, we can't, um, do two rescuer skills, we can do one rescuer, but oh, we can, okay. you know, we discuss the two rescuers. And then when it comes to mega codes with ACLS, um, you know, we, we can't gather around anymore for the, you know, the team leader, the airway, um, so what we do is we, we do it from their seats and everybody has their own mannequin. And so it looks a little, uh, it's pretty interesting how it works because one person has the mannequin, then somebody at the next table is bagging, you know? Oh. <laughs> and then the next table, somebody's putting on the AED pads and shocking that their medic. Oh, wow. That's it, interesting. It, it, it's fun, too. You know? <laughs> yeah, that sounds no. fun. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> cool. The last time I took the ACLS, like we were still doing the med mega code. Yeah. So, yeah. And the yeah, pals. Exactly. Yeah, wow. So it's, out. it's been very smooth with that, you know. Okay. Yeah. So we'll be putting the link to where you guys can sign up for classes uh, for Mike. Um, so he offers BLS, ACLS, PALS, EKG um, classes, NRP, um, mm -hmm. ventilator uh, classes. Uh, yeah, ventilator uh, classes, right? Uh, um, what else am I missing? Anything else? Uh, 12 lead, IV therapy, blood withdrawal. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a skills class also, a one-day skills class for IV mm -hmm. um, therapy. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, a lot of classes. Nice. Amen. I love it. Well, we're around out of time right now, but okay. thank you. Thank you so much. I know you're busy. You're doing classes 
every day. But thank you so much for taking your time and talking to me and talking Absolutely. basically to the people. And, you know, it's Respiratory Care Week. So happy yeah. Respiratory Care Week to you. Oh, um, thank you so much. Okay, Mike, thank you so much for everything. And I Absolutely. wish you the best of luck in oh, your business. So Okay. Um, we're going to put the link for your business in here so that people can sign up. And I will see you in a few months for okay. my NRP recertification. <laughs> Excellent. Looking forward. Okay. Bye. Okay. See you. Okay. Take care. You All right. too. All right. Bye bye. -bye.